Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 267 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. As we draw towards the end of the summer flow, it's obvious that the wasps have had a good summer too. They seem to have suddenly appeared and in large numbers around one or two of our apiaries. Time then to batten down the hatches, get cleared up and give our colonies as much protection as possible. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Hi everyone, welcome back particularly if you're listening and you're not part of my Patreon group. It probably means that you're listening to this episode of the podcast sometime in late August or even early September. That's because our group members get to hear the podcast as it's released, making it particularly relevant, whereas the general release of the podcast goes out around four weeks later. If you'd like to hear the podcast on its release date, head over to our Patreon page and sign up to our small but perfectly formed group of beekeepers. And as an example, this podcast is live to our supporters today on the 23rd of July. It's a rather damp and dreary looking 23rd of July morning, certainly at the moment. I'm genuinely recording this early on Sunday morning. Yesterday was Marley Watch Day, my dog-sitting commitment, and a very pleasant day it was too. The trouble is, by the time I've been out for a couple of half-decent walks, thrown balls and other toys for him to fetch, prepared and served his luxury meals, he actually eats better than I do, and by the time all that's done, there's not a great deal of time left to sit and put a few words down to share with you all. Yesterday was a little disrupted as it was the day of our beekeeping association's summer picnic and wouldn't you know it, the forecast was for heavy rain right at the time that we'd had it all planned out for. A few hasty messages via social media, calendar changes and phone calls and it was cancelled. It wasn't great because I'd just collected a truckload of jerry cans of Appy Mix 75 sugar syrup for some of our members to collect at the picnic. Still, I needed a little exercise and the weightlifting must have burnt a few calories. As luck had it, I was able to get messages out to most everyone that had some on order so they could pop over to the unit here in Norwich to collect it. And actually, it was an opportunity to share some time chatting on a one-to-one basis and hear about how people are getting on with their season and the plans they have for the future. I'm always happy to answer any questions, but it's always covered with the caveat that if you ask me a question, there are always going to be several different answers. So don't just take my answer as gospel. Do a little more research and see what others have to say about the topic and then make your own decision. There are, of course, some things that we all agree on, but for the most part, there's always an alternative route that you can take through this beekeeping journey. And don't forget, it's your journey and your beekeeping. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. One of the beekeepers that popped along to collect syrup was asking about autumn splits. And this is a really good example of what I've just been saying. Autumn splits are a fantastic way of developing overwintered nucleus colonies to allow for winter losses or spring increases. But here's the thing, I probably won't ever carry out autumn splits ever again, and I certainly won't be recommending them to anyone. As regular listeners will know, I suffered a disastrous autumn last year. We lost so many splits to wasps that I won't ever go down that route again, I don't think. I much prefer the safety blanket of a spring split, warmer weather, no wasps and the opportunity to easily correct any issues with queen introductions or where you've raised your own queens, recovering any problems with poor matings, for instance. It just seems I have so much more time to get things right with spring splits, whereas in the autumn, the weather is changing fast, the days are getting cooler, the nights are getting longer, and it just feels that time runs away from me. But... 
I know a lot of beekeepers who swear by autumn splits, have great success with it, and very rarely find they run into the kind of challenges that I've faced. Maybe I was just unlucky last year, or just wasn't paying enough attention to what was going on in the apiary until it was too late. Either way, the splits we made this year in late spring and early summer are now developing into fabulous nucleus colonies, and in some instances are into full-size hives with as many as eight frames of brood, fully-fledged colonies in their own right, and one or two of them earmarked for a trip to the heather. So, my advice to anyone carrying out autumn splits is don't do it. Actually, it's not. My advice is go carefully and fully understand the challenges that you're up against. Another point here with autumn splits is don't split too hard. And actually, here's another good example of why I like and prefer the spring and summer splits. In early summer, we took a colony that was intended for the John Harding queen-rearing setup and found it to be rather too large for what we intended. That was, we found it to be too large for a single brood box as it had thrown up around eight or so queen cells and was intending to swarm. Instead of removing all of the swarm cells, we split the colony down, left the original queen in the John Harding nuke setup and popped all of the other queen cells into their own mini nukes with just a frame of brood and a frame of food. Robbing a frame of food from other healthy colonies in the same apiary to make up the numbers. So we had six two-frame nukes, all in the apiary that the parent hive was settled in. All of the flying bees went back to their original hive position, further depleting the two-frame nukes that I had created. What was left was barely enough bees to cover the frame of brood and single queen cell. Yet they all survived. Every single queen emerged and mated. The nukes were left alone by other colonies in the apiary because there was a nectar flow on, and they now sit in the same apiary as fully developed colonies, easily able to protect themselves from the vagaries of the autumn and winter. In fact, a couple of these colonies are also in the selection for going to the heather, such is the growth of the brood area in each. The point is, they didn't have to worry about attacks from other colonies or wasps and hornets. Everyone else was too busy getting out and foraging and doing their own thing. Right now, if I did the same thing, I have a feeling it would be a total disaster, and I would lose all of them through wasp attacks, robbing by other colonies and even poorly mated queens if I happen to go down that route. So if you're going to make any splits in the coming autumn I would suggest do it now as soon as you get your honey off and don't split too hard. Maybe take a four or five frame nuke out of a strong colony and move it to another apiary so it retains all of the bees rather than leaving it in the same apiary and having all of the flying bees go back to the parent colony. It's a mistake I made last year, and it's been a valuable and also painful learning experience. Just staying with the whole wasp challenge, now is the time to have a quick look round your apiary and make sure it's all tidy, and there's no brace comb or other temptations left laying around. Now I know a lot of you will have colonies at the bottom of the garden, or if in an out apiary, a nicely mown, well-kept spot, free of spare equipment and void of any temptations to other colonies and wasps. But if not, now is the time to head out and get it tidy, before the locals catch wind of a free lunch and then turn their attention to your hives, picking on the weakest first before moving on. If you're looking to remove honey from your colonies, make sure you have a good look at your supers, clearer boards, crown boards, roofs, in fact everything stacked up on your hive. You're looking for gaps, tiny little holes that wasps in particular can ease their way through and rob your honey supers. You'll be amazed at just how quickly you can lose a super of honey to robbing. Any gap you see needs to be covered or filled. Be particularly careful when you're checking your supers in preparation for clearing the bees out and adding a clearer board. The temptation is to lift out a frame or two of honey to see if it's all capped. 
no problem here. In fact, it's quite sensible to check, but it's the point at which you replace the frames that you have to be careful. In your excitement or haste at trying to get this honey back into the box, it's possible to inadvertently replace the frame so that it's not quite sitting right, particularly if you use something like castellated runners. The frame sits a little proud, it's a little too high, you pop the crown board back on and then the roof quickly and don't spot it. The frame that's left a little high creates a gap when the crown board is replaced and when you put the roof back on the gap is hidden beneath the sides of the roof. As you turn your back on the hive the wasps and bees in the neighbourhood will quickly pick up on the opportunity and when you return the following morning to take off that oh so heavy super you're somewhat puzzled by how light it feels. Maybe it's because you had a big breakfast and you're feeling strong today, but you'll soon enough get that sinking feeling as you lift off the crime board and see hundreds of wasps fly out from between the frames. Take care, don't be in too mad a rush to set everything up for clearing, and I'm sure you'll do just fine. If you're just taking one or two supers away from your home apiary, the process of getting them into the kitchen or honey room is pretty straightforward. Have a board that you can pop the super down onto and a second board to place on top. If you have a big garden, it might be prudent to use a trolley or wheelbarrow to move the supers as they're likely to be very heavy. And in this instance, use a strap to keep the boards tightly fixed to the supers. Get them inside as quickly as you can and then you can relax, but just a little. For out apiaries, a little more planning is needed. It's the same process, but maybe you need to carry the supers to your car or truck. The same advice applies. Use a trolley or something similar to take the load. Mind those backs. This year, I'm grateful to have a little bit of extra help. Extra helping hands to assist with the lifting and it's going to make the job quicker and a lot easier. And that means less opportunity for robbing. The plan is we'll have a team of three. One in the truck, one on the trailer, and one at the hives. The truck will be positioned near the hives. We're lucky to be able this year to get the truck and trailer all the way up to and alongside the hives. I should say that we'll be using our rhombus clearer boards again this year, I like the simple way they work, and they really do work. I'll probably stand beside the hive and remove the roof and crime board. It's not a particularly technical job, but if you're not familiar with the process, it's easy to lift the super off along with the clearer board, which has become stuck to the bottom of the super with the weight of the honey gluing the super down to the propolis. The outcome is a flood of bees and they're not going to be the happiest. I'll ease the super off, team member two will lift the super onto the trailer and team member three will stack the super and replace the top board to prevent bees and wasps getting back into the super. One of the most useful bits of equipment I have for this particular job is the leaf blower. We actually have two. One is a Bosch battery leaf blower and the other is a petrol blower. Now, I'm not a real fan of simply blowing bees out of supers. I much prefer to use a clearer board overnight. And then when we remove the supers, if we have a few bees left in there, it's a simple enough job to give it a quick blast to remove them. It would be great to think we could get all of the supers back to the honey room without a single bee, but that's just not going to happen. What I want to avoid is a mass of bees clinging to the front door of the unit as if there was a swarm in there. One of the challenges you may face when clearing your bees from the supers occurs when the colony has, for whatever reason, become queenless. The entire clearing process using whichever clearer board you use is dependent on the colony being queen right. If the colony is queenless, the workers have no incentive to move back down from the supers through the clearer board and into the main hive area where they can pick up on the queen's pheromones. In this instance, you have a couple of options. Let's say you didn't realise that your colony was queenless and you go back to the hive and find the super is still full of bees. It's a bit of a chore, but if you want the honey, 
you really need to get the bees off the frames. This is where the leaf blower is really handy. But what if you don't have a leaf blower? Well, the second option would be to brush or shake the bees off. I wouldn't use a bee brush, that's a certainty. All that happens is the bees get stuck in the fine hairs of the brush and with every pass of the brush, you load more bees into the brush, making them angrier and angrier. It was suggested to me a while ago that a goose feather works really well, and the fact that the goose sheds its biggest feathers on a regular basis means you don't even have to wait until Christmas to get one. Other alternatives include a handful of lush grass. I've used this on numerous occasions, and it works really well. It's soft and pliable and doesn't damage the bees. Again, the process is very straightforward. Grab your chosen tool, feather, grass, brush or other soft green leafy implement. Have it ready to hand. Remove the crime board and have a spare empty super next to the hive. Remove each frame one by one and shake as many bees from it at the entrance of the hive. Don't shake them back into the super, they'll just add themselves to the next frame to be removed. Once you've shaken the bees off as best you can, grab your bee removal tool, otherwise known as the goose feather or whatever you've chosen to use, and give the remaining bees a quick brush off the frame while holding it by one lug. A quick twist of the frame and brush the reverse side and then place it into the spare super. Continue through the super until you've removed all of the frames and quickly cover the super that the frames are now in. Don't rush it, but do try to complete the task as quickly as you can before too many bees get back into the super and the frames that are in there. And with that, you can take it back to your honey room and get it extracted. Job done. Well, good luck with your honey crop this year. I'll update you perhaps next week from the honey room as we begin our summer crop extraction. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to check out my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk and for my latest videos and podcasts with more updates, tips and techniques, it's the same Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And remember... I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Yeah.